Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, Kathy. Hi, welcome, Julie. Give a good wave. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, and uh, welcome. It's Kathy Frey here from IMCO, from the International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organization. And welcome to this week's live webinar as part of our Maternity Natural Health series. And uh, we're just getting people, people are just signing on in at the moment. So we'll let that all happen. And um, we've got Julie Cottle here today, who is a very special person um, in my life. And I'll explain that more. Um, and so just, just a reminder to everybody, um, if you can go into the chat and uh, let us know whereabouts in the world you are and your um, health professional role, or um, maybe you are a mum expecting, let us know your gestation. And um, also, it's just a reminder that down the bottom is that Q&A button. So if you want to ask Julie any particular questions today, just go into that Q&A button. And um, yeah, so we'd love to know where everybody's from and um, whereabouts in the world you are. And we've got a um, brilliant subject today um, that has always fascinated me and uh, has always been very, very relevant, relevant in my own practice as a midwife, you know, advising women with lactation. Um, issues and um, concerns. So it's just great that we're going to focus on that topic. Um, so yeah, welcome, Julie. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> oh, I'm just stoked to have you here. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just mentioned before that Julie and, uh, is a special person in my life. And that is because Julie, for those of you who don't know, um, is our CEO um, and general manager of IMCO. So um, she has been quietly working behind the scenes, um, involved in a, in a lot of day-to-day -day stuff with what we do here. We're, you know, we're currently all volunteers and um, we can't do what we do without amazing, wonderful people. And Julie's got a really important role here at IMCO. So um, thank you, Julie, for everything you do for me and for all of us as part of this community. Um, and Julie is um, a exper very experienced and compassionate naturopath. And she's also an international board certified lactation consultant. So that's a really wonderful combination. Um, and of course, she's been working with mums and babies for a long time, for about 20 years or so, I think, Julie. Yeah, a bit more than that now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time flies. Quite a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's got both that clinical and academic interests, um, particularly in postnatal wellness, um, lactation management, and um, so what we're going to be talking about today is very specifically herbal medicines and breastfeeding. Um, you know, and throughout the world that we know that women are using herbal medicines while breastfeeding. In fact, um, I've looked at a lot of pieces of research um, with regards to the whole maternity journey. And um, on average, if you sort of look all around the world and all the different pieces of research, um, I think we can basically say that around about two thirds of women are using um, some kind of um, complementary alternative therapies during their pregnancy. And then that obviously continues often into their um, postnatal uh, lactation period as well. So, um, you know, this, the, the, we're using this a lot. So um, it's a very, very relevant subject to everybody. Um, but of course, there's always those questions. Is it safe? You know, when is the best time to use it? Will this affect my baby? Um, will it affect my milk supply? So, you know, these are the, some of the questions that we want to go over today and um, have a real pragmatic um, evidence-based approach around herbal me medicine, because obviously we've got some very rich traditional knowledge 
um, that we can apply to our modern understanding of lactation and how it all functions. So um, welcome, welcome, Julie. Let me, uh, I think let's get, let's start with, we're going to have a sort of casual conversation today. Mm -hmm. And um, so how about uh, you introduce yourself? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I think you've done a pretty good job of that um, already, <laughs> Kathy. But um, so I'm Julie, I'm a naturopath and a lactation consultant. Um, started working as a naturopath just before my um, my eldest son came along and he's now 20 years old so it has been some time um, I, I developed an interest in um, pregnancy birth and that whole um, transition period very early on in my um, in my career it just was something that really kind of sang to me even before I had my own children and then when I had my children that, um, <clears throat> and you know, it was just very You're experiential. Really and, and, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. And I, I um, you know, just started using it myself and um, really sharing that with my, um, my patients and then sort of built up um, a practice sort of based around fertility, pregnancy, birth and um, I worked um, as a volunteer breastfeeding counsellor for quite some time um, and built up quite a good body of lactation knowledge during that, that mm -hmm. time and noticed that there didn't seem to be a lot of naturopaths that were really working in lactation and it was a very, um, well, it, it is a very specific um, and specialised field of health um, and I think that if... Um, if more people or if the professions sort of considered lactation to be more of a specialty field that that we'd probably have um, a more knowledgeable community of um, health professional professionals being able to help our mums yes. um, yeah actually that's an interesting question in itself so um I'm not a naturopath, so I haven't gone through that training. But when you do go through that training, you know, is is there much time spent with regards to um, medical herbalism and um, lactation? Um, sort of a one of those, you know, subjects that you sort of zip through a little bit. Uh, not really. So, mm. de in the herbal medicine um, study that I've done, and I, I did. I studied a long time ago back at college, but I've also been back um, to university and studied herbal medicine um, at a ma master's level um, at university. And in both cases, um, you know, we look at herbal medicine as a whole and we look at applying that to specific circumstances and, you know, breastfeeding is often lumped into the pregnancy um, category. And I, I don't believe it should be. It has its own special and unique um, needs and, yes. and, and it works. It's a different physiology. So we need to apply a different understanding to it. Yeah. So it is one of those areas that um, even this, if we say the specialists um, of being naturopaths or you know medical herbalists if they're the specialists of medical herbalism which obviously they are even within that specialization there's still quite a limited amount of knowledge around using herbal medicine within lactation um, so you know it, so often I think that um, women uh, can inadvertently be asking the wrong person so you know mm. they're asking their obstetrician or their the general practitioner, MD, or they're asking these people, oh, is it okay for me to take that? Now, these people aren't even trained in naturopathy or herbal medicine, so they can't answer it. But even those that are trained in it still have, in a way, a limited knowledge. Yeah? Yeah. Right there? Yeah, yeah. But I guess um, the difference being that a medical herbalist um, knows where to find the information. They know... Right what good sources are and um, 
they know how to interpret the research that's out there and available. So I think that um, right. it's it's always useful to um, to consult somebody that has studied herbal medicine, um, and as well as your um, your pregnancy care providers. And um, hopefully between the different people that you do consult, you will get some evidence-based information and some good information that helps you to, um, to make uh, decisions that are appropriate for you and your circumstances. Okay. So, um, oh, I might just have a quick little um, look at the chat. Who have mm. we got coming in here? Um, we've got Australia and New Zealand. And oh, welcome everybody here. We've got a lovely mix of, we've got um, some midwives and lactation consultants and um, doulas and it's just fabulous. Fabulous to have you all here. And um, you know, those of you that have signed in but haven't put a little a note into the chat, feel free to, we'd love to see, um, know whereabouts in the world you are from. Um, and don't forget to, that you can put um, any questions um, into the Q&A that you may have for Julie today. Um, so uh, let's just sort of go to the basics of um, what we're talking about today. So tell us what the, why do you think, you know, what's important around, uh, around this whole topic? Well, as you mentioned before, we do have um, a large number of women that actually choose to use some kind of um, herbal medicine product while they're breastfeeding. So um, you were talking before about the, the stats on um, pregnancy, which was somewhere around two thirds using yep. some kind of complementary medicine product. <clears throat> we do have um, some prevalence data around herbal medicine use specifically applied to um, lactation and it, it appears to be around about 50% um, throughout the world. And obviously that's um, quite a lot higher in developing countries where traditional medicine is used um, quite frequently, particularly um, in the pregnancy birthing space. Mm -hmm. um, but even in Western countries, Australia, um, Italy, uh, the UK, it's, up around 50% and um, a lot of research has shown that it's even higher than that. Right, okay. And are there um, any guidelines existing at the moment around using um, herbal medicines in relation to lactation? Um, so there are, there's, um, the World Health Organization is generally supportive of traditional medicines and um, herbal medicines are included in that and they do promote the safe and judicious use of, um, of our traditional medicines, um, you know, provided they're provided by the right people um, and, and they do of course call for integration. Um, specific in-country guidelines do tend to be quite um, broad and, and all-encompassing. Um, so I think I've got a, the National Health and Medical Research Council um, guideline here. So the National Health and Medi Medical Research Council, that's our Australian government um, health recommendations. Um, and they say more research into this area is needed before using herbal remedies and breastfeeding. Um, and I do find that that's pretty typical of what you will find yeah. everywhere. You know, yeah. if you go to a yeah. women's hospital and ask, should I use herbs while I'm breastfeeding? It'll say more research is needed. Yeah. And then uh, unfortunately, we, the, even getting the research is pretty much impossible or close to it because of, of two main things, you've got the ethics issues where um, often you know you've got universities who will the, the ethics committee is not going to approve and say oh yes you can run this trial and see see if this herbal medicine harms the baby right <laughs> no one's going to, and no woman are going to participate going oh yes I don't mind trialing to see if it harms my baby you know um, so you've got that so how are you supposed to get any evidence when you can't get the ethics committee approval. Um, and then um, on top of that, who's going to fund it? Because 
often, you know, so much of our um, medical based research is funded by pharma, you know, pharmacological, you know, by big farm. And, you know, because that's how they're going to make their royalties. And of course, they can't make royalties on anything that's naturally found in nature. So there's, there's it's like we're sort of in this no man's land that we're never going to be able to get that evidence mm. um, or it's going to be very difficult. What's your whole thoughts, Julie, around the fact that, you know, it's this go-to line of, oh, we need more evidence to say it's safe, but how on earth are we going to get the evidence? Mm. Well, I think in a lot of ways it is kind of a fair assessment of what's there. So I think well, well, I think that that advice is all encompassing and it really doesn't serve women and there's no nuance in it at all. It does kind of reflect what is available because to do the type of research that you need to do to get safety data, which allows these organisations to say, yes, it's okay, um, it's very, very prohibit prohibitively expensive and very difficult. And it's only around about 5% of pharmaceutical drugs that have specific lactation safety studies to, um, to support their use during, um, during lactation. Um, and, you know, the general principles are that we want to, that, that we avoid use if possible. But of course, again, that doesn't serve women because no. women need healthcare when they're breastfeeding just as much as they do before and after pregnancy. And so um, really, you know, it's a reminder that that polit that sort of uh, philosophy of saying, oh, well, you know, the, we need more evidence around medical herbalism to say that it's safe um, during lactation. We can pretty much use that on any pharmacological drug as well. Yeah, I guess oh. we could be saying, oh, we need around it. Yet we do tend to um, accept it as a society if the doctor says to take that and um, it should be right. Because we work out the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics and you sort of work out the logic of what's going to transfer into the milk and how that's going to be processed by the baby's liver. And really the same sort of um, thing could, could be done or is being done with regards to medical herbalism? Um, yes and no. So it is a little bit different to drugs because drugs are, you tend to be one big dose of one constituent, whereas herbs are lots of tiny little amounts of lots of different constituents. So Hi. this is a hard thing for research because it's so complex and it's difficult to actually study what's doing what. And you can imagine the pharmacodynamics of all of those different things are very, very difficult to trace. Um, but um, in a lot of ways, it's quite good for us because um, we've only got small amounts of those, those constituents. And when we're looking at, um, drugs and, and lactation or any kind of substance in lactation, we, the most important thing is how much of that the infant is actually going to get in the end mm. um, and what that may do to the infant, how that may change their physiology or, or affect them. Um, so generally, by the time you've, you've taken a herb and it's been through the mother's body and it gets into the milk there's only very tiny amounts of of the end product in there um, that's not to say that that can't have an effect on the baby because there certainly it certainly can um, and we always have to to be very mindful when um, when we are ingesting anything that um, that could come through to the milk but generally it, it has found been found to be quite safe mm. and side effects are quite um, quite rare. So, um, what are the what are the commonest um, uh, herbs that you are that recommending that women take, and for what sort of circumstances? I mean, I you know we know of sort of you know fennel and blessed thistle and whatnot for uh, helping to increase milk supply, but you know being a specialist like you, with yourself being a lactation consultant and a medical herbalist naturopath, um, what are, the, are your favourites? 
Well, interestingly, I, I try to minimise my use of herbs while women are breastfeeding. So um, I try to be very targeted to what it is that they are seeking help for. Um, and I, I don't generally recommend blanket use of herbs during breastfeeding, but... Yeah. So that, there's, there's certain remedies for certain things that you are your kind of personal favourite go-to um, that you, you know, that does sort of solve some problems for women generally or? Yeah, so I, I would, probably my favourite would be um, a tea, a nettle and calendula tea, I think is a lovely little blend. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Nettle and calendula. Yeah. Very, yeah. very nutritive. Um, obviously, there's a lot of um, galactagog type teas out there and they mm. can vary as to what's in them. Yeah. But that's interesting to get your um, preference in there. So nettle and calendula. Yeah, okay. that's a... It's a nice one, <laughs> a nice one to support, just to support mum's general health, um, not necessarily for, um, you know, for breast milk production or anything like that, because as I say, you need to be very, very targeted as to how you use herbal medicine products um, during breastfeeding. But I think it's a nice little supportive blend and it's, it's a nice little, I don't know, nutritive and nourishing thing to have. And sometimes on those um, breastfeeding tea packets, they'll say things like, you know, you take four times a day or something. And I, I always kind of wonder, why is there a limit? Or is that being, you know, uh, so with, with the nettle and calendula, is that mm. something that, again, you would limit? Or would you say you could sip it all day? Or what's your thoughts there? Um, okay, so follow, following the principle of minimising exposure to um, to the substance for the baby, I'd say I like if I'm using something therapeutically, then you need to get a therapeutic dose. But if you're just right. using something for general health maintenance, like herbal teas or whatever, yeah. I I wouldn't go more than three of the same type in a day. Okay. Yeah. So you can mix it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great. It's great to get these overviews. Mm. And um, I and what about, I mean, probably that, you know, the two commonest things that, you know, can be dealt with in that first six weeks is, um, is all the commonest thing in the first six weeks is, is women thinking that they are, don't have enough milk supply. Mm. Um, and then we can have the other situation, um, you know, when we get a woman that's sort of six to eight weeks uh, postnatal and she's obviously in a, still a real overproduction mode. Mm -hmm. um, so do, is there some um, particular remedies that, you know, when, when they're not able to sit down with you and have that individualized care or the women are not really able to afford to sit down sometimes with a medical herbalist and have that individualized care, are there some favorite ones that you would recommend for undersupply and oversupply? Uh, yes. So for, let's go with undersupply first, because it's yeah. such a, um, it's such a common um, worry that, that women have. Mm. They often begin their breastfeeding journey wondering or thinking that they're going to have supply problems. And then they go through the hospital process and they get out at the other end. And what do you know, they've got supply problems. Um, mm. Often it's because of poor management and because they've had a poor start and they need a lot of hands-on help to actually um, to work through um, the actual breastfeeding problems or to, to um, have information corrected um, so that they are breastfeeding in a way that actually helps to build a supply rather than, um, rather than maintain it or... or sort of suppress it even which often happens so um, even with any kind of um, herbal galactagogue or even any kind of medical galactagogue there needs to be a, a really good amount of support um, and information provided to the woman 
um, to go along with that. So I would encourage any woman that goes out to pick up a herb or galactagogue from the health food store or whatever, to also um, make a call to, um, to like your local volunteer organisation. So in Australia, we have ABA and they can be really helpful um, with just providing 24-7 um, breastfeeding counselling um, and certainly low supply is, um, is one of the things that they can help with often. Um, and if you're able to get the support of a... So probably um, and around the world, La Lachley? Yes. About that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And those organisations can be absolutely wonderful. And I would say it's the definitely the first thing that you should do if you've got any kind of breastfeeding problem. Yeah. So rather than going straight to the herbal medicine, it's saying, hey, actually, there's probably just more issues. Maybe it's the latch. Maybe it's the lack of frequency. The lack yeah. Of, yeah. Like there's just look at the, that other picture first. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. And then if you're looking for herbal support, I really like to use something that's got goat through in it. Um, I find that to be quite a um, quite a nice galactagogue and it, it does goat through. Goat through, yeah. 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 Um, that's one of my favorites. Shadavari is another one of my favorites. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Indian herb of love. Yeah, yes, the Ayurvedic herb. Um, yeah. <clears throat> teas, I think, are very, very useful for women that are going out and self-prescribing and, and, um, and picking up galactagogues from pharmacies or from health food stores. Actually, going back to the tea question, somebody mm. did ask the question, um, with the nettle and calendula, is it kind mm. of 50-50 or, or is there a sort of... A, how would you mix those two? Yeah, I would go more nettle than calendula. So probably okay. two thirds nettle, one third calendula. Okay, fantastic. Mm. All right. Um, so what about the, um, you know, the, the the fennel and the blessed thistle? So those are really, you know, been pretty popular. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fennel's, um, fennel's a great herb for babies that are a bit windy and fussy mm -hmm. um, babies that have got gut gut problems fennel can be really helpful for that um, it seems to be a bit hit and miss as a galactagogue but generally mm -hmm. herbs are um, they, they work well together so often it's, it's not a case of because um, it, it might be that um, uh, Lisa, this all has sort of been my go-to, a, 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 but I, I know that suggesting fennel is popular with a lot of midwives. Um, and it's probably, now that it's interesting that you say that it's sort of a little bit hiss and miss as a galactagogue, as in a milk stimulant, um, but it's settling the baby. And even the fact that the baby's got more settled, the mother could be perceiving that she has made more milk. You know, yeah, the baby's looking happier. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Helps things to be a little bit more relaxed. Yes. And I certainly remember um it's going back a bit now, but in my own breastfeeding days when I would be sipping um breastfeeding teas and uh, I'm pretty sure I was pretty convinced it must change the flavor almost a little bit as well because uh, you know if I'd have a, I'd sip on some tea and then the baby would be feeding and I kid you not that I think that if the babies could have purred they would have <laughs> it's like you know, they're, they're drinking the milk and going, mm, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> it's <laughs> so true and that was before I was a midwife and I remember thinking I think you're doing something to this flavor because they love it <laughs> yeah absolutely well we know that um herbs that are very high in the vo volatile oil content like fennel is definitely one of them so herbs that are very nice and smelly those sorts that you might get as aromatherapy oils um, those sorts of herbs uh, the, the vault sorry the um, the fat soluble constituents do come through the milk in quite high quantities so uh -huh. you so do get making it yummy definitely do get flavoring <laughs> of the milk um, milk changes depending on what mum 
eats and drinks all the time but yeah herbs okay. will definitely yeah. definitely change it I, I yeah. like that like your description it sounds a little bit like catnip for babies yes, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I would say it was yes it, it, you know yeah it was like catnip for them um and what about blessed thistle yeah blessed thistle's a lovely herb um Again, I don't use it for, it's not something that I recommend for everybody, but it is something that I do like to recommend for, um, for people that have got a little bit of, um, a bit of a hormonal kind of component to. Yeah. Um, when you've really ticked off all those other boxes and you know that everything else is going well, um, but that baby is only producing six wet nappies a day and um, is only putting on 180 grams in the week and you go okay I think we do have a supply issue um, and then I would find as a midwife you know we'd, I'd sort of say to them to look just take the full whack that's on a suggested dose that's um, you know on the packet and you might find that that's more than you need and you can dial it back um, and I would find some woman who would need six capsules a day and some woman would need one capsule a day yeah um yeah. yeah so that's sort of on track to what your thoughts and recommendations are yeah yeah um it's a, a good observation that some women do need more and some need less it's yeah. herbs are very um people re react to them and respond to them very differently and that's um one of the reasons why we need to be quite mindful um when women are taking them during this time, you need to be quite mindful of how it might affect them, their supply and the baby. Yes, and what about um, fenugreek? Because that's another very popular um, remedy as well. So what's yeah. that one? Um, fenugreek, I use fenugreek um, a bit for um, women that have had gestational diabetes, mm -hmm. um, and for women that have blood sugar issues, but it's actually not a herb that I would recommend that um, people self-prescribe for during that breastfeeding time. Um, although it is a very, it's a very popular one, and I know that a lot of people do um, do use it. The main reason is that um, it is one of the herbs that's sort of described in the literature more so than others. Um, it, it has been looked at because it is one of the most popular um, yeah. herbs that breastfeeding women use. Um, there is a bit more uh, research behind it and there is some concern about, um, uh, or the, there's like a maple syrup urine smell that can come from it. Um, there's, I mean, again, it's mindful watching. Um, and as I said before, it can uh, change blood sugar levels. So I, I just feel like it's something that it's best used under supervision or with um, knowledge of what to look for and and, um, and how it might have some how it might affect you. Okay. And what about um, with those? I mean, often women. I mean, women are supposed to oversupply in that first, mm. you know, because um, of course, you know, the first day a baby's born, they drink what about thirty mils over twenty four hours. And by the time they're a month old, they can be drinking a litre um, a day. So, uh, of course, that woman needs to be sort of oversupplying in that first month while baby rapidly catches up. Um, but certainly, you know, if, if she gets to the point where um, it's two months after having her baby and, and every time she's feeding on one side, she's just pouring out the other side then mm. you you kind of know yeah we probably do have a bit of a milk for Africa kind of <laughs> oversupply issue which can become really problematic for them um, yeah. and um so I know parsley and sage are, are sort of associated with helping to sort of dial down the milk supply a little bit what's your thoughts on oversupply issues um, yeah, again, some of it can be about management and um, again, reach out for breastfeeding help if, you're, if you've got oversupply, if you feel like you've got an oversupply problem. Also, perhaps consider donating to a milk bank if that's yes, possible yes. for you. If they exist in the area, even if it doesn't exist in the area, I notice um, that 
uh, there's, you know, quite often there's Facebook groups who um, sort of basically set up their own version of doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is wonderful, especially for um, premature babies because, um, yeah. you know, we don't want to be giving them formula. No, well. we don't. And there really is, um, it's, it's quite difficult to, to get enough breast milk to yeah. to support these bubs and the breast milk that goes through the the milk banks does tend to go to premature babies so mums that um that do want to use donated breast milk for for not even older babies but <laughs> for babies yeah. um do find it difficult to get milk so yeah th i think that that's a really useful thing to consider if you do have oversupply Yes. But back to your question. <laughs> um, lemon balm is a um, is is one that would um, that can help to reduce milk supply, and it's also a nice relaxing herb. Um, again, I would use it as a tea. Yeah. Um, and watch baby. Um, it as lemon balm is um, it's a. An, anxiolytic so it's a, a herb that can reduce anxiety um, we just need to be watching the baby and making sure that there's no signs of central nervous system depression or you know that but generally I can't say I've ever seen it but that's something that I would watch for <laughs> yeah um one of the questions just going back to um fenugreek um, with it affecting blood sugar levels, um, somebody was just asking the question, does it cause the blood sugar levels to drop or to rise? To drop. So it can reduce blood sugar levels, which right. can be absolutely wonderful for some people. Um, and I've used it with great effect for, for women that, are, um, that have gestational diabetes and preparing to breastfeed. Right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so... How do we, what are the ways that we can generally, um, tactics that we can use to minimise any um, adverse sort of reactions? Um, so, as I've said quite a few times, reinforce this, mindful watching, just know that you've taken it, just be aware of any changes in your body or your baby. Um, we want to minimise the amount that you're taking. So we want to be able to treat the mother, but minimising the exposure. So um, lowest dose possible. As a, as a herbalist, this is when I choose low dose herbs. And I do tend to be a little bit of a, a thumper with my dosing at, at times. But with yeah. um, pregnancy and breastfeeding, I choose low dose herbs if they're indicated, so if the herb is indicated. Um, so that basically means don't go out and just choose to take herbs just because, like use them if there's a reason to support a, a health goal, but but um, yeah, you don't you don't need to be um, just taking them to support support your health. You can do that through food and um, you know generally general lifestyle stuff at that point and is there what are the ones that are um are important perhaps to avoid um well the most important herbs to avoid I, look i would say the biggest risk out of out of all of this mm -hmm. the risks are, are quite low but by far the biggest risk is to the mum's milk supply mm -hmm. um so be be careful to um, avoid herbs that can affect the milk supply. And um, I, I will send out a, a list later, if you like, of herbs that, um, that we know that, that can affect the supply. But some quite common ones that people might not think about, um, chickweed, uh, lemon balm, which is one that I mentioned. And, you know, lots of people um, will go and have a lemon balm tea. I've got a plant that sits at my front door and I pluck its leaves and sit down and have lemon balm tea pretty often um, and actually I wouldn't have even known that that could affect my supply even with my fourth baby by which time I was a lactation consultant and had 
plenty of knowledge of herbalism. <laughs> um, Oregano is another one. And of course, these are all dose dependent. We're not talking about food quantities. Like it's okay to put some oregano in your spag bowl for dinner, but um, <laughs> yeah. but maybe, you know, having it as teas or, um, or putting it in a herbal formula mix is, it's not the right time to be doing that. Um, parsley, as you say, and again, I would put that in the same bag as oregano it's dose dependent you've got to eat a lot of yeah, parsley you, before it's gonna hurt yeah so you don't want to sit down and be eat a big bowl of tabbouleh um if you're trying to um increase your milk supply that's probably yeah not so good. yeah that's right yeah <laughs> sit down and have a nice big bowl of oats instead yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um peppermint is another one that i would avoid if if you've got supply issues or um you're concerned or I would actually avoid well building supply um, once you get to a point where you feel that supply is evened out and you're making enough milk to meet your baby's needs and everything's sort of going along swimmingly and you've found that nice little balanced um, part of the seesaw then I think it's fine to have a couple of cups of peppermint tea every now and then right. but yeah you know, using it, say, three times a day, every day for a period of a, a couple of weeks, that's when you may well start to see changes in supply. Um, I think you mentioned sage is mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah. And um, so sage is, is the old mid midwives go to for, for drying up milk and for, for people that want to wean quickly. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, spearmint is another one. Thyme. And again, it's that um, high volatile oil content. It's very, all these very smelly herbs. Um, these are the ones that have the more, that have a tendency to get into the milk because they come in through the, through the fats and they right. sit in the fats and they stay there rather than, um, the water soluble ingredients that kind of, that, that they, they go into the milk maybe 45 minutes or so after the mother's ingested it. Um, and then it, it slowly starts to, to leave the milk as well. Um, we don't get that with the volatile oils. They actually go in and they stay there until the milk is removed. So the baby will get those, those oils. Um, You've actually got a um, a wonderful little um, sheet uh -huh. of information <laughs> yes. uh, that I'll show everybody, um, which we could um, include um, on our um, message. So tomorrow, everybody who's registered for this seminar we, receives an automatic message through Zoom. And... Um, we could perhaps let people, um, if they want to receive a copy of this, then they could. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, are herbal medicines compatible with lactation? And you've got some really interesting sort of things in there. One of the um, areas that you talk about is the difference on um, when you are feeding a baby who is you know, a, a brand new newborn uh, or neonate versus a baby that's six months old. Mm -hmm. And like one of the statistics I found was absolutely fascinating was that the um, half-life, for example, of caffeine, uh, when a mum has a drink of coffee, um, it, the half-life in a brand new baby is almost 100 hours mm. whereas the half-life in a six-month-old baby is about two and a half hours yeah so, i mean that's a huge difference um you know and the thing that we always sort of tend to say with say coffee is um you know drink it just before during the feed sort of thing but so that by the time that you're feeding that baby again and sort of two or three hours later, it's basically sort of out of your system. Um, I would explain to women that, you know, whatever is going on in your bloodstream is what's going on in your milk stream because those um, caffeine molecules are just sort of traveling over by osmosis. 
So um, it's the same sort of level. So if you have that drink of coffee, um, you know, basically sort of two hours or so before, two or three hours before you're feeding the baby, so meaning straight after you've just fed the baby, mm. um, then most of it's out of your system by then. But yeah. when you hear the stat that a newborn baby takes 100 hours practically to process caffeine you'd almost go goodness we shouldn't be drinking any of it um, mm. uh, how how rapidly does it change from uh let's say caffeine and specifically um how rapidly does it change from that brand new baby taking 97 hours to that six month old it is quite a is it um quite rapid it's it is a slow process so it, it takes time for the baby's um liver and kidney function to mature um, to for them to get to a point where they're able to um, to metabolize these um, these different things that come in um, I, I don't actually I don't actually know the timeline um, completely but it is it is a gradual process and it does take um, at, at least a few months for that for that to happen and it's still happening at that six month mark that maturation of the um of the baby's um liver and kidneys um yeah so the younger yeah, the baby the idea of limiting your caffeine when you're pregnant and then sort of as soon as you give birth hallelujah time for a decent coffee mm. um i'll do it straight after a feed so it's out of my system by the time um I, I guess it's, uh, there is still remnants in your system. So um, we know that. Um, mm. and, and it's going to stay in the baby system for a long time. Yeah, yeah. It's a long time. It is a long, long time. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would definitely recommend holding off on introducing the coffee for, for a little while longer. So many mothers are told, oh, no, you can have your coffee. Don't worry about it. But then they've got yeah. these babies that are really wakeful and difficult yeah. to settle and, and, and they're still told that it can't be the coffee or it's not the coffee yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. always worth looking at the coffee or the tea yes. or the hot chocolate it depends on how sensitive your baby is some people can have right. coffee and and the baby's not going to show any signs of um you know being on edge because of it but other babies it really affects them um, we've got one comment just come through um, and uh, she's had a client who uh, when the, the client wanted to reduce her breastfeeding or to stop breastfeeding, um, she rubbed oregano oil um, over her breasts. Ah, yes, that's actually, um, that, that is a, an old trick that's um and compresses can be wonderful as well so oregano oil in a compress and actually that's a, a great way to be using um herbs during breastfeeding is to use them topically um so yeah. just um and how would you do that uh i mean would you just sort of steep some herbs and some cold pressed olive oil or some I mean sort of cold pressed almond oil or something like that I'm yeah sure. well with oregano you can you could make your own um oil and it can be as simple as olive oil or really whatever you've got lying yeah. around and you just um you just infuse it so you put the oregano into the oil you can leave it sitting there for a few weeks or you can um give it a bit of a head start and put it in a slow cooker and just um just keep it on a very, very low heat for a long period of time, which helps to get the, helps to take the oils from the oregano out into the olive oil. And then you can just use that as a, um, as a topical application. And with that, I'm sorry, my ignorance here on this bit, um, but we so what about the difference of it being fresh herbs or it being dried herbs? Um, so is there a big difference in the impact of using those? Um, fresh herbs do tend to be milder when you dry the herbs you're actually you're taking the, the water out mm -hmm. um, so the 
that the volatile oils in particular become more concentrated and all of the other constituents, they all become more I'm concentrated. Just, <laughs> I'm just imagining, you know, people putting a, a, a saucepan on the pot with olive oil and sprinkling a whole packet of oregano, dried oregano <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, well, hold on, are we giving them the right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I mean yeah, 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 totally. It's yeah. it's the same thing. I mean, I, just the I prefer that, that you go and get your dried herbs from our health food store than right. <laughs> Master Foods, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's it is it, that would do the trick. That would do the trick. Okay, yeah. that's really cool. Um, all right. So now, is there any? Um, we will be winding this up soon, and. Um, so if anybody's got any other last questions that they would like to give Julie with regards to um, herbal medicines um, and their compatibility with um, lactation, um, send that on through. Now just put that into that q and um, I have, think I've got through most of those questions today. So that's really, well, we've got through them. Julie has. Um, so Julie, is there anything else that we um, have sort of missed talking about that you'd like to cover off today? Um, well, I think something that's worth noting is um, that you know, we know that so many women do use herbal medicines while they're breastfeeding. We know that they reach out to their health professionals for advice. So they, they ask their pharmacists, their naturopaths if they have them, their midwives, um, their lactation consultants. And generally those people don't feel um, like they are armed with adequate information to be able to answer these questions. Yes, yes and I agree with you there. Yeah. <laughs> I really feel that these are important conversations to be having with women. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of um, a, a lot of women choose not to tell their health professionals that they're using herbs, um, particularly if they've asked for um, asked for advice and they've been shut down or not given um, useful advice. So, um, so they tend to use it sort of in secret and that's um, not really serving um, the women and, and it's not helping us health professionals to do our jobs and support them in that really, you know, in the woman-centered way that we wanna be working with, um, with people in this space. So um, one of the reasons that women give for, um, for not communicating with the health professionals is that they're often not asked about it. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I know that I did that myself. And that was before I was a midwife. And when I was a mum, I thought, I'm not going to ask my GP doctor about the fact that I'm taking this herb. He's not a naturopath. He's not a herbalist. He's, I, I'm not interested in his opinion. Um, yes. Yeah, so, and women do. And then yeah. you just, and you'd think that going to your midwife would be, uh, that they would be more knowledgeable on that but of course that's not something that that midwives are trained on at university generally um actually we've got a comment come through uh from uh michelle she goes i work at a hospital and the lactation consultants there give out handouts on using fenugreek to a lot of mothers should this be happening on a regular basis I think in that setting, um, and because it's from the lactation consultant who will, who is providing information about how to use the herb, um, and she's likely knowledgeable about um, about any potential impacts for the herbs um, that that she's recommending. Then I, I think in that case, um, it's it's okay. Um, yeah, I, and of course, provided that her, that the care, other care providers know about it as well. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that that's, that's great. It's great that the hospitals um, are, are, you know, giving, giving that option and, and giving that information. But, you know, I feel like there are other, um, other galactagogues that are perhaps a better choice, but, you know, right. fenugreek is widely used for right. that purpose. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we've also got um, a question. 
what can be used to help women with hay fever and colds? Um, a question mark is sort of herbal supplement, herbal treatments, eucalyptus oil, etc. Because that's so true. You know, we do get rhinitis so often um, mm. in pregnancy, and I know myself. I just, I just think I had a blocked nose the, for three times nine months, um, and yeah, it's awfully unpleasant, mm. um, and it can be really challenging to sleep when you feel all blocked up. Yeah. Um, so although that's not relating to lactation any particular um, go-to on that one mm. um, well it is related to lactation because women get sick while they're breastfeeding and uh, they look at you know, they they need true. they need yeah. health care when they're breastfeeding as well so yeah. um, look I, I would just go look vitamin c is universally quite okay <laughs> for, for breastfeeding and it's not a herb but and it does go into the milk, but it's also, um, we, we know that it's a, a pretty, um, it, it's compatible with breastfeeding. Yeah. And actually, um, I mean, it, it, all um, minerals and vitamins are also regarded as complementary therapies anyway. So yes, that's <laughs> right. It goes into that, even, which is yeah. part. But yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah but what about um, when it's not sort of for a cold and maybe when it's um, just straight hay fever? Yeah. Um, I would also go echinacea. Echinacea is something, there are some cases of babies having allergic reactions to mums taking echinacea. But it's rare, but it's definitely something to watch out for. Um, so if you see any changes in the baby's skin, generally it's a skin rash. Um, so be mindful, but echinacea is something that um, is generally regarded as a as a herb that can be used in lactation, and it it's great for supporting um, coughs and colds, flus, and hay fever as well. Excellent. And um, oh, a question about when you talked about vitamin C, any particular sort of dosage amount that you'd be talking about when somebody's got a cold and they're pregnant or um, breastfeeding? Yeah, I, I recommend um, just go with like a 500 milligram twice a day. Mm -hmm. um, you could, depending on the person and, and depending on um, the circumstances, you could perhaps go 1000. But um, I, I do tend to go with a lower dose, which is which for a naturopath, a lower dose of vitamin C would be 500 right. milligrams twice a day. That's quite ah, a low dose. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's quite low dose. Oh, another question come through. Um, what about Sambucus? This seems to be a big thing at the moment. Yeah, um, so Sambucus is, um, it, it does go into the category of being a herb that's quite high in the volatile oils. Um, yeah, I, I don't use it a lot. I don't, I, in fact, I haven't used it for quite like over a decade <laughs> myself. Wow. Okay. Um, right. But it is a herb that I used to love. I just, I haven't, I haven't used it a lot lately. So I'd, I'd be interested to, to know um, what people are using it for. Oh, um, okay. during lactation I'd be yeah right and somebody else has added a comment here um nettle tea is also excellent to prevent and treat hay fever yes that's true and actually that little blend that I mentioned before of um calendula and nettle would be a good one for hay <laughs> fever <laughs> yeah you could add some echinacea to that actually yes yeah um and you take all those boxes Okay, well, look, we are going to wind it up now because we're really over time. And um, I can't thank you, thank you enough, Julie, not just for being here today, but for being here every week um, <laughs> as we're behind the scenes here at IMCO doing what we do and um, bringing this all to you. So, um, oh, if somebody's put here, Sam Bookers is an immune thing. Yeah, okay. So, Oh, I was just wondering how it would affect the milk. So, um, yeah, well, because it is quite high in the volatile oils, it is something that will 
um, enter the milk and it will sit in the um, in the fat in the milk. So yeah, I would I would it's it wouldn't be my first choice during wow. breastfeeding and I'd have to look into it. And actually that's something that I would like to share with um, with people that have been here today is my list of resources where where to go for um, for good information about herbs. And I I go to these places and check whenever I'm um, putting together a herb mix for somebody who's breastfeeding. I, I like to really like check off each herb. That's fantastic. Okay, so we'll definitely uh, make sure that we've got that um, information with details about that information within the um, email that everybody will receive within the next 24 hours. Um, so look, that's everything today. And thank you so much, all of you who are, are here in person. We have a lot of people around the world that I know registered to watch the videos afterwards. Um, because their time zone or their work schedule means they can't be here live but it is so nice to have you guys here all live and um, you make what we are doing here worth doing <laughs> otherwise Julie and I are just interacting on our own <laughs> and uh, so I hope everybody had a, a, a great um, informative time here today and thank you so much Julie for everything you're so you welcome <laughs> <laughs> okay so thank you everybody thank you we'll say goodbye see you bye <laughs>